You can see Bill, you can take one away. Right. I just put my little bottle of water down here. I, I'm on a slight medication which makes me thirsty at times. So if you want to do a water test later, it's pure water, I can assure you. You're welcome to come and test it later. It's nice to be with you again today. It's ages since I've been here. In the meantime, I've had six months over in Oz, and it was really lovely going back to the churches that we looked after there and spending time with the folks. And the Carmel lost their pastor through a few problems they had there and um, asked me to fill in for a while, so I was there for three months. And yeah, it was just great to be back there. We really had a great time, and uh, after that, we were, I got a little van over there and a little old caravan and we were going to do a trip around Australia. It was my life's dream to go right around Australia. And while we were there, we saw advertised these fares on the um, Indian Pacific in the Ghan. $199 from Perth to Sydney and the same from Adelaide up to Darwin. So we booked on the train. I mean, it was cattle class. We had to sit up, but that was okay. We had a marvellous time. And, and the wonderful thing about it is that the people you meet, and as you know, you, you were sharing today, the opportunity you have to have a little witness every now and then. It's amazing how you can get a little word in here and there and just start people thinking along a different track. We just had a ball of a time. We just loved it. And uh, we came back all full of enthusiasm, full of fire. And then our son, of course, accepted a position over in the Chatham Islands. So I shot over there for a while and had time with him. I just got back. I'm going to show you just a couple of slides later on. Oh, this one up there now and uh, talk to you about that. So, yeah, so it's nice to be here. I think it's been just over a year since I've been here, so lots happened in that time. And sorry, sorry Susanna can't be here today. Um, Susanna, as you know, I think she talked to you about the work she, she does with uh, trying to uh, train girls particularly to work in nursing homes, those girls who don't have work and are on the dole, get them off the dole, and uh, it's a real challenge to get them motivated and she not only has to train them to become able nurses, but she's got to find them work. So she's associated with the nursing homes all around the place and is very closely tied. And then once they get a job, she's got to try and keep them in the job for a year. So that means going back and visiting. And so she does a lot of that sort of work and it's very tiring. And she came down with a bit of a uh, flu, not the swine flu, I don't think. No, it's not. <laughs> and was feeling a bit miserable. She said, oh, look, I've just got to cop out today have my, on my own. So she, she apologises to you all that she can't be here today. And um, yeah, on the, on the Chathams, uh, uh, this is... Um, have I lost my control now, Lewis? It was in my pocket. Can you see it down there? We could <laughs> I'm having a bad morning this morning. I left my hymn book over there from Sabbath School and couldn't find it. Um, where did it get to? I can't manage this without the control. It must be here somewhere. Um, it's amazing where things get to when you get to our age, isn't it? You, you put them in one place and you're sure they're there. And then, oh, here it is. I've got it in my bag. <laughs> Stop laughing, Gary. <laughs> we had a little laugh there about how this happens when you get old. Well, this is how you get to the Chathams on the, the, this plane. The, the actual uh, one who owns the plane is a, um, lives on the Chathams and... Carl knows him very well, and he knew I was Carl's dad, so he invited me up the front um, to sit with him in the, in the seat up the front, and it was amazing. Really had a great time, and uh, it was a great place. This, this is on the road from the airport um, to where, where we were living. You can see some of the sea. That's a lake, a freshwater lake. The Chathams is about 100 kilometres long by about 50 kilometres wide. So it's quite a big island. It was bigger than I thought it was. I thought it was just a little, little line there, but it's like, it's like living out in the... Uh, on a boat in the Pacific Ocean. As you're a long way out, you know, you're 800 k's out and there's nothing around you except the South Pole. And uh, it's straight out from Christchurch and it's very windy and uh, quite cold. This is the house where Carl was living. You can see the township just in the uh, background there. And this is the beach. You can see the house now above my um, left shoulder. Sorry about a lot of the slides we've got um, us in it because we like to have people in the backgrounds of some of the slides in the foreground. And this is the township of Waitangi. This is where all the uh, activity takes place. Just a little, um, that's the hotel there. That's the biggest place there. And uh, you can see the, this uh, ANZ bank and a few little things there that you can do at Chatham. There's not much there at all. This is the wharf where you look down to from Carl's place where we did some fishing. And uh, 
we caught a, uh, a um, what was it called, a hokey po mokey, a mokey fish, and that was a small one, there was huge ones there, and one of the locals came along, you know Tony Butler up in Kaitai, this guy was just like Tony Butler, looked like him and spoke like him, and he showed us the correct way to fish, you don't use the traditional uh, bait on the hook, you use this thing they call a, um, uh, a uh, kayo, and they open it up and spit it, and you take it out like an oyster, and you tie it on the hook with cotton, and that's how you catch the fish, and that was one of the reasons why I was over there, was uh, looking after my little grandson. The, one of the, the teachers at the school, uh, his dad um, was dying of cancer, so she had to come back home to Wellington for a time. And he, uh, Carl's wife is a teacher, they asked her to come and teach, and they asked me to come and look after the child. And being Mother's Day, I thought I'd put that in because, um, you know, mothers do such a great work uh, with their kids. And there's his mother there. And even though, you know, when I arrived at the airport, I hadn't seen him for, for a while. Uh, he's just one now, and uh, when he saw me there, he reached out his hands for me to take him. You know, really, really heart-wrenching stuff, you know, and I grabbed him and hugged him, and it was so great to see him again. But he still missed his mother. Nobody can replace a mother in a child's life. I don't care what people say. Nobody can replace a mother in a child's life. So important. And, um, you know, I, I, have a, I have a real healthy respect for mothers now after looking after this little guy for a month. At that age, at one year's of age, they're into everything, everything. You can't turn your back for two moments. And, you know, when you finally got him to sleep in the day, he used to have a sleep in the day, I just go, phew, now I've got some time for myself. That would only last for an hour. I really don't know how mothers cope with two children. I couldn't have coped. I think mothers have very special gifts that men don't understand. Amazing. And, uh, you know, they... We put a barrier around. He used to get to the um, stereo and the TV and he wanted to keep fiddling with the knobs. And so we put a, a barrier there, you know, a coffee table thing that was fairly high. And I was doing something in the kitchen. It was very quiet and I went and there he was standing on the coffee table, balancing and laughing and cackling and fiddling with the knobs. They are so quick and so fast. So I give great respect to mothers this morning. This was an interesting lady we met there. She's the policeman's wife and they've become very close friends of Carl and Flora. And um, the boy is called Jaunty too. It's a very unusual name, and they're both called Jaunty. And we're talking to her, and we found out later she was brought up as Seventh-day Adventist at uh, Wanganui. And she was so thrilled to, to see us and talk to Carl and realise that there was somebody who understood her background. She's not one now, but she's a very lovely lady, and they're uh, very nice people. Uh, we went out fishing one day. One of the locals took, took us out in uh, this beautiful big uh, boat with um, twin jets on the back, and we, we saw this um, huge albatross. And there's a lot of them down there, and they were following around the boat behind us. And, uh, oh, I went the wrong way. This is a new toy for me. There's some of the fish. How, how they fish over there, those of you who do fishing, I know some of you like fishing. See the size rope that they use? They have a huge, huge sinker that's very heavy. That's the blue cod, and they, um, that's how they catch them that way. Very, very nice fish to eat. We met uh, the uh, oldest um, Moriori. There's none left now, though the true-blooded Moriori's have all gone. Quite a sad story about the Moriori's because they're very peace-loving people. And I won't go into that now, but I, I went and met this guy and he wasn't very communicative, he didn't seem to want to talk very much. But uh, we got some idea of what the Moriori was like. This is the, what the countryside's like. Um, the roads are all metal but they're very smooth and not corrugated in any way. And you can see the countryside reminds me a little bit of patches like the desert road area through there. And Susanna, when she came out, I was ringing up and telling her how cold it was and how windy it was. And, and, and as it happened, when she arrived, the moment she arrived, the sun came out and the wind dropped. She was only there for a week. And we had beautiful weather the week she was there. And she said, I don't know what you were going on about. It's a beautiful place. And I took this photo of this tree and I said, yeah, just look at this. The wind does blow here. And it is, it is a very blowy place and there's a lot of cloudy weather. But there's some beautiful beaches. And uh, the people there are, are very basic, down-to-earth people. Very, uh, yeah. So we had a good time. It was great to go there and meet the folk there and to see something different. But um, today I was um, wondering what I was going to talk about with you folks. And I always have this dilemma when I come and go in churches and um, not being there regularly. And, and I thought, and I lined up a sermon, and Susanna said to me yesterday morning at breakfast, she said, what are, you, what are you talking about tomorrow? I said, I'm going to take it on how to be pleasing to God. 
And of course she knows exactly what sermon's coming up when I say the title, you see. She's heard them all before. And uh, she said to me, oh, don't take something heavy like that there. And I said, but the people at Mill Road appreciate a good theological sermon. She said, no, don't, do something lighter. So I, being Mother's Day, I bent to her will and I'm going to take a, a sermon called The Wimpy Prophet, just a little bit lighter, seeing we have uh, some younger ones here, taken from uh, that um, Christian comedian, not the sermon, but the title, when he talked about Moses. And I thought, that's a good title for the one I want to talk about today. And we all have heroes. I don't know whether you have heroes or not, but I have a hero. And, and my hero in life is Peter Blake. Something about that guy that I just admired, you know, his, his ability to build a team and his ability to, to be committed to a program. And, and I love what he said when he won the Louis Vuitton Cup. You remember when the first time they took the cup? And they were saying, you must feel very proud you've won the Louis Vuitton Cup. And I just loved his reply. Remember what it was? I didn't come here to win the Louis Vuitton Cup. I came to win the America's Cup. I thought, wow, what an attitude. I love that attitude. And uh, then, uh, you know, his, his focus for a Christian, how focus on Jesus should be like, his focus was on winning that cup. Oh, well, there's a lot of Christian things we can learn from him. So he, he is my, my hero. But in, in Bible... In the Bible, in the scriptures, um, Gideon is my hero. And that's where we're going to take our study from this morning. I want to turn to Judges chapter 6 and verse 7. And going through to 8. Judges chapter 6. So if you've got your Bibles, let's open our Bibles because we'll refer to them from time to time here. Judges chapter um, 6, starting from chapter 6 and looking into verse 7. Gideon had some interesting experiences. The first one we'll look at this morning was see, to see Gideon on the mountain. Because Gideon had some, some great mountaintop experiences in his life. And uh, the first one I want to see is that when he was in the wine press, and you'll see the verses there, verse 11. He was, he was in the wine press because the, the Midianites were harassing the nation. And, and if, you, if you look there at verse 1, you'll see uh, the situation. And again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel. Neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels, and they invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So they're in a pretty desperate situation. And this is why our, our story opens with Gideon in a, in a wine press. And, and a wine press was a, a hole, a square hole, usually dug in the ground. It was down deep enough so that the seepage as they stood on the grapes. You know, during the grape harvest and quashal of grapes that didn't seep out through the dirt. So it was fairly well down. And so Gideon was down, not because it was the time of the grapes. It wasn't time of the grapes. The grapes were not ready yet. But he was down in this hole, this pit in the ground, threshing wheat for his family. He was hiding it from the Midianites so they wouldn't see it because nobody expected people at that time of the year to be in a, in a, in a, in a harvesting grapes, you see. So he was pretty secure there. And, and as he was... As he was working, you know, I, I imagine um, God looking down. I'm just using my imagination here a little, and it's good to use your imagination just a little. I imagine God looking down and, and seeing Gideon and, and, and saying, wow, look at that guy. And then calling his angels and saying, come and look at this. As they come over, he said, look at that guy down there. He's a doer. And Gideon was a doer. He wasn't sitting down whinging about the fact that he didn't have enough food. or anything. He was out doing something about it. And God said, look, I want doers in my work. That's my man. So he commissioned an angel to go down and to, and to meet with, with, uh, with Gideon. And uh, when the angel came to tell him, um, uh, Gideon decided he would, he would take on the mission and he would go. And the first thing he did was to offer up a bull. I want you to imagine this for a moment, a seven-year-old bull. Now, I, I don't know if you have ever taken a bull and killed a bull in the paddock. A seven-year-old bull. A seven-year-old bull is pretty powerful and pretty strong. 
And, and sometimes we have, we have the, the sanitized version of what Old Testament times was like that came to us through Uncle Arthur, I think. You know, that, uh, s- somewhat like this, that um, Gideon goes into the paddock and the bull says, Good evening, Gideon. What have you come for? And Gideon said, The Lord has asked me to sacrifice you as an offering. Very well, says the bull, and stands there and waits for Gideon to take its life. Can you imagine that, what it was like? They were real people. The more I read the Old Testament and the more I dig into it, the more I get excited about it because I find they're just like me. And life was real. Life was rugged. Life was tough. And how those guys managed to wrestle that bull, a seven-year-old bull, I don't know. I, I remember Dad, when we were kids, I was, I was five at the time, and it's, it's very vivid in my mind, watching Dad wanted to dehorn one of the Jersey bulls that we had. We are living down at, out at Marnie, down Austin's Road, down your way, Gary. And we were living on the corner there, and Dad had a farm. And he wanted to dehorn this bull. And it was causing problems to the other cows, you know, goring them with its horn. And so, I don't know how they got it down, but as I remember, I was sitting on somebody's shoulder, I don't even know who it was, and I was looking over the stone wall fence that was taking place. And there was the bull on the ground, sitting on the ground, with a ring in its nose. Now, one side was a rope where Brother Sheffield, old Brother Chef, was hanging on to one rope, and the ring on the other, and, and rope out the other side with Warwick or Jan, um, not Jan, um, what was Warwick's older brother? Malcolm. Malcolm, I think it might have been Malcolm, hanging on to the rope and keeping it tight, you see, with the pressure on the bull's nose. And there was Dad coming from behind, cutting off the horn of the bull with a hacksaw. He got the first horn off, no problem. And I thought, thinking to myself, wow, well, that's easy. And he started on the second. He must have got a bit deep with the second because he must have hit a nerve. All of a sudden, that bull erupted. And Chef, I've never seen Chef move so fast. I can still see him now. He dropped that rope and he was over that fence in two bounds. And I, I do believe, Gary, if you keep your eye open, you can still see a one-horned bull in those paddocks there somewhere. It never did lose that horn. Now, how, how just imagine what was involved and, and, and taking that bull and killing it and then cutting it up. Imagine what was involved. I remember seeing them cut up a bull up in Papua New Guinea once. There was a whole tribe of them hanging on to this thing. They finally got it down and they cut it. And I tell you what, it was sickening to see. Really sickening to see. And I became a vegetarian after that. So it, it's amazing. And so this was, this was something that he did during that night. And his aim was he pulled down the altars, the old altars. He had real courage, a mountaintop experience. He pulled down the altars that were used in that village to worship pagan gods and set up an altar to God and offered that bull as a sacrifice to God. And then another mountaintop experience he had was the call, your country needs you, <laughs> the call to military service. And so the cry went out. And the first response, there were 32,000. And can you imagine the conversation with God that night because God came to him again and Gideon says, um, didn't go so well, Lord, I only got 32,000. But never mind, we'll make another call tomorrow. Maybe we can rake in another 20,000. And the Lord said, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh. It's too many. And Gideon says, what? It's too many? I mean, you heard what the Midians were like at the beginning. They were like locusts. And the Lord said, I want you to go out and say to the people, those who are afraid, who don't want to fight, tell them to go home. I suppose Gideon went out that next day and he thought, well, maybe... Two or three hundred might go back. And he was left, after he'd made the call, he was only left, oopsie, he was only left with, it's coming, he was only left with 10,000. 10,000. And now he's getting a bit discouraged. And the Lord comes to him again. He says, the Lord says to him, Gideon, sorry old buddy, there's still too many. And then he put them through the test. You remember they went through the water and they set up a, a mock battle situation. And Gideon led them through and the Lord said, watch what they do. Tell them to take a drink. And they took a drink and most of the people lay down and threw themselves on the edge of the water and drunk the water, had a break. Others went through and just gulped the water as they ran through. 
And the Lord said, put them aside. They are the ones I want. And there were only 300 at the third response. And the Lord said, now, those are the ones I'm going to use. I wonder, I wonder what I would have done if I'd been there. What would I have done? I don't know. I think I would have had a good drink of that water and had a good, good old guzzle because, you know, this was the last chance you're going to have a drink. But 300 was ridiculous. How was he going to conquer the Midianites with 300? And the, the, next, um, the next one I see was the actual battle strike where they actually attacked. And it says that Gideon led out his 300 men and he waited till the change of the watch came when people were at their most alert period, the new watch. He wanted to cause as much sensation as he could. And they went out there with a clay pot, a lantern, and a trumpet. Would have been more like a bugle. And as they surrounded the Midianite camp, remember these people were there by their millions, not that's exaggeration, but thousands. And these 300 standing up above them on the hills. And at the instant that Gideon gives a signal, the bugles blow, get a sharp rod, and the night watch see it down there in the camp. And they say, wow, what's happening? And all of a sudden, 300 lights are switched on. Boom, 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 as they break their clay jars. They'd never seen electricity like that. You know, like, well, yeah, we can sort of switch on, switch comes suddenly. That was not like that in those days. It took ages to get the fire burning, get the lamp. And all of a sudden, these lights are suddenly switched. It caused panic in the camp. And God stirred them up so much that they began to fight each other. And then the rear guard attack was that the other tribes came in behind them and followed them through. And a great victory was won that day. One of the mountaintop experiences for Gideon. But there was no bragging at the victory parade. I want you to notice um, this verse, uh, Judges 8 verse 22. Here's the greatness of the man as, as we see him here. Judges 8 and, uh, verse 22. It... Um, then the Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us out of the hand of Midian. But God told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Wow, what an attitude, wasn't it? There was no bragging at this victory parade. Look what I have done. Look what we have done. How great am I? None of that. The Lord will rule over you. A real mountaintop experience for Gideon. But tragically, that's not the whole story. Gideon also had his valley experiences as well. As well. And the first one there was in 622 when he was down in the wine pit threshing the wheat. The angel said to him what he was required to do. And then the angel said, go and prepare me a meal. So Gideon goes off. And God was very careful in the instructions. What he told, and he prayed him, mock nut meat. You know what mock nut meat is? You know what mock nut meat is? You don't know what mock nut meat is? I, I remember talking about mock nut meat at Warburton Church one day, and the people there asked me for the recipe <laughs> of mock nut meat. So the next week I came along with my fishing line and showed them that's how I prepare mock nut meat. Mock nut meat in this case was as it says in the Bible there, roast goat with gravy. Does that sound nice? Roast goat. I see some of you nodding there. Roast goat with gravy. That's what it was. And unleavened bread. And he went and prepared this goat. And, and again, he, he had to start from scratch. He had to kill the goat and prepare it. And how long it took, I don't know. And he came back with this offering to this stranger, an angel. And then the angel said, Put it there on the rock. As I'm reading this story, I think, oh no, I know what's coming. What a waste! <laughs> what a waste! <laughs> and the angel stretched out his hand and zump! It's gone. I mean, he could have given it to the poor, couldn't he? For them to eat. <laughs> but it was gone. And then suddenly the wimpiness of Gideon comes out. Oh, woe is me! Woe is me! He says, I've seen God, I'm going to die! I'm going to die. I mean, he'd been talking with this stranger for all this time. If God had wanted to kill him, he would have done it ages ago. And now he comes to the realisation and he shows his wimpiness there and God says, come on, get up and get going. You've got a job to do. 
The next time we see his, uh, his wimpiness and his experience in the valley is at the time of the victory. Remember that wonderful stand he took? He says, I will not be your king. God will be your king. But he said to them, he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. And you'll do something else. He said, some of you, you, you women wear, wear gold and the, the Ishmaelite women in the camp wore golden earrings. They wouldn't do too well in Adventist church today, would they? But they wore these golden earrings. They did. And he said to them, Gideon said to them, give me some of your golden earrings and I will melt them down. And he made an ephod. That was like the uh, garment of the high priest wore. And the whole theory behind this ephod was that it would be, the people would come and worship here at his hometown rather than go down to Jerusalem, you see. He was making it easy for them. And so he set up the ephod there with the golden earrings that the women wore. And the verse there says that this thing became a sneer unto Gideon. And you know something? He led the whole nation back again to idolatry. What a tragedy. One false move like that, and it was, had such long repercussions attached to it. And so that was a real valley experience for Gideon. Another, another problem with Gideon was that he had a very low self-esteem. You remember when the angel called him, he said, I just want to tell you something angel, he said. He said, don't you realize that I belong to Israel? Look at us. We are the most insignificant nation now in the world. We are nothing. And he said, within that nation, I belong to the tribe of Manasseh, and that is the most insignificant, non-achieving tribe there is. And he said, within that tribe, we have an iwi, and in that iwi, I am the least. And he said, within that iwi, we have a hapu, in that hapu, I am the least. And in my family, I am a nothing. I am the least. See, he had a very low estimation of himself. I am a nobody. I am nothing. And that's why, as you see through his life, he had these other low experiences that he needed constant reassurance. You remember the, the, the time when he was getting, and he was beginning to wonder if he could really do this and, and he, said, he said, and he said these words, he said, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, he said to God, as you have promised, he knew it was a promise of God, but he still doubted. And he said, I want you to put out, I'm going to put out a fleece. And he said, if the, if the ground is dry and the fleece is wet, then I will know. Next night, it was like that. He went out, the ground was dry and the fleece was wet. And he began to think, and he says, well, wool is a, is a substance that will absorb moisture from the atmosphere. So it is possible for the wool to be wet because of the nature of wool and the ground to be dry. So he said, Lord, reverse it for me the other way around. Make the ground wet and the fleece dry. That'll be a real test, he said. The next night he went out and it was bone dry. And he needed that constant reassurance. And then right at the end, when it was just about time to go, the Lord sent him out to the camp of the Midianites and he stood outside a tent. And one of the, the, the guys was having a dream, and he told his mate a dream. He was hearing this conversation. Gideon was standing outside the tent. And the guy said, you know, I saw a bread roll come through the camp and knock down all the tents. And the man inside the tent said, oh, that's obviously the sword of Gideon. And Gideon thought, that's it. And that's when he went on his mission. So he needed constant reassurance all the way through. So my question is, and we want to look at now is in, in just this, wrapping this up, where do we go from here of all this story? Where do we go from here? Gideon is a reflection of ourselves. I look at Gideon and I find I have those mountaintop experiences and those valley type experiences in my life. Gideon is so much like me. So much like me. Some days I feel on top of the world and I sing chorus and I praise God and I'm so passionate about it. Other days I'm down in the dumps of despair almost. I get discouraged. Don't you? Gideon is so much like ourselves both individually and collectively. Another thing we learn from Gideon, we all have altars we need to dismantle in our lives. We all have altars that we need to pull down, like, like Gideon pulled down those altars of pagan worship. We have altars in our life that we need to pull down as well. One of them is the Frank Sinatra altar. You know what that one is? I did it my way. <laughs> I love the song, a beautiful song. I did it my way. Pride. That was the devil's problem. You know, the whole, the whole thing about the old devil was self, wrapped up in self. That's why, you know, 
I probably will never do it here, but the whole mark of the beast thing is all centered around self. Well, we've got our eyes fixed upon some other person and some other things and some other issues that we're looking at. And there is a place for that. Yes, there is a place for that. But the main problem and the main issue involved in there is the great tension between my way and God's way. That's the real issue in the mark of the beast. My way or God's way. And God loves it when we focus on this other stuff. And there's a place for it, I know. But God loves it when, the devil loves it when we focus on that because we miss the real issue that God wants to teach us. God's way. We have to dismantle those, though, those altars. Another one we need to dismantle sometimes is the, is the false altars that are built by what I call religious engineers. Self-righteousness and criticism of others. Why is it we're talking about in our Sabbath school class just a little this morning, it came up. Now, it was a good lesson, Jamie, I enjoyed that. Um, why is it that sometimes people who go to church are so critical? I don't know. I have my ideas. But we are. You, you, you start listening to people talking outside, and that's one of the comments they make about, about Christians, is that we are critical of others. We, we set ourselves up. And we have to dismantle those altars. We, we should never, 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 never judge other people. It was in the passage this morning about by their fruits, you know. But you look at the context of that. It's looking at mediums and wizards and people who claim they can perform miracles. And that's the context in which it's talking about. Jesus said, judge no one. We need to keep the Bible in its context constantly and totally. One thing I'm very passionate about is looking at the Bible in its context. What is it saying? Not picking text out here and the text out there to so, so point. Follow the Bible sequence through and see what it's saying. And, and this is what does worry me at the moment. I've mentioned this before and I mentioned that because it's a burden of mine. We're spending too much time and too much of our feeding from the Word of God comes from videotapes and downlinks and all these things which are very good. And it's good information. But it's not building our own message of God. We're feeding from somebody else. We need to feed from ourselves from the Word of God. I, I could take a lot of time just talking about that because I've set on a new pathway in this in the last two or three years. And it's an exciting one. And so what I'm saying is we should never, never judge people. I find that Gideon, on the other hand, had a model of leadership. And we won't take time, but you can look at it there in the story. The Ephraimites came to him after the victory. The tribe of Ephraim was, was the biggest tribe. And they felt they had the right to control because they were, in numbers, they were the greatest. And they came and it says they poured out their fury and wrath on Gideon. Why didn't you call us in the first place to come? And they really turned on him. Now I know what I would have said. I don't know about you, but I would have said, I would have hit back and I would have said, now come on you guys. You were given the invitation, you didn't come. And as soon as you saw we are getting the victory, then you wanted to come and join in on the fight. But you didn't come before. I would have really hit them back. You know what Gideon did? And, and I love this. I wish I could learn this in my life. I wish I could learn it. Gideon said, and he listened to them, and then he said very quietly, what have I done as compared to you? The thing that I've done is like picking the first gleanings of the grapes. You have picked the full harvest. You know what it says after that? I love the next words. It says, at that the anger of the, Israelite, of the Ephraimites abated quieten down. Wow, what a lesson of leadership, isn't it? What a beautiful lesson how we should relate to each other and relate to people. You know, I, I, I still live for the motto and I still pray to God to give me patience. But I say, hurry up about it, Lord. Lord, give me patience, but hurry up about it. And I pray, God, that we could all have this, this attitude of leadership in our dealings with people and that the anger abated. Then the next thing I noticed about that, to be natural. And when the Lord called Gideon, and when Gideon was doubting and doubting and doubting and doubting, God said to him, Gideon, go in your strength. And the emphasis on the word, your, your strength. I love that. Go in your strength and I will be with you. It was a totally different way that Jonathan had years to come when the kings were ruling. Remember Jonathan when he wanted to attack the Philistines. He was totally different in his approach. 
He went out with his armor bearer and he said, let's go out and we'll expose ourselves to the Philistines. I don't mean the way that we think of exposing, but reveal himself to the, to the Philistines. And he said, if they say, come up to us, we'll take that as a sign from the Lord. If they say, wait there, we'll come down to you, we'll take to our scrapers and we'll run. So he went out there and he showed himself to them and the cry went out, come up here and we'll show you a thing or two. And he said, right, let's go. He didn't have to wait for a fleece. He didn't have to wait for a sign from God. He just went for it. And what a victory he had. Totally different approach. Totally different. And God said, go in your might and your strength. We've got to be ourselves, friends. We're all different. You know, like ministers are all different. Some come and they have an emphasis here. Others have an emphasis there. And everybody's different. We should not judge people. Not judge people. And so God says, go in your own might. And I notice the next thing about the story of Gideon, that God takes nobodies and makes them a somebody. I love that. God takes nobodies and makes them a somebody. Wow. You know, and, and often it is that God seems to do more with those that are the least. As Paul, you remember Paul said, he said, I come to you in fear and trembling, not with fancy words, not with palathery, flowery statements, not with very spiritual and, and high flute and language. I come to you sometimes with rather rough language and rough approach because I want God to be glorified, not me. I think that's why sometimes God uses those that are the least and he makes them into somebody. So again, I repeat in, on judgment, never judge another spirituality. I hear it sometimes, I hear it so often in churches. Oh, he's the spiritual one, or he's not very spiritual. We should never do it. How do you know the heart of a person? Never, and I repeat again, never, never, never judge the spirituality of another. Never judge the spirituality of another. And the next thing I notice about the story of getting that God is more concerned about our availability than our ability. Our availability. Are we willing to do things for God? Here these guys, a clay pot, a lantern and a trumpet, and what they're able to do with God and God's hands. Wow. It reminded me of the, of the, the, the Second World War and the, the Russian, no, the First World War, sorry, First World War and the Eastern Front. And the Russians were trying to stop the Germans. And the Russians had no rifles or no weapons of any sort. And they're out there in the trenches with um, picks and rake handles, bits of wood trying to fight the Germans with their sophisticated guns. This story reminds me a little bit of that. God was able to wreak the victory. And the, and, the, and the final point is that Gideon epitomizes the gospel to me so much. You know, Judges 8 there tells the story that the majority of the people who chickened out, all those people that chickened out and wouldn't go and fight and that backed off, and those that lay down and strunk the water and drew it in, had a great break there at that time. All those people that did that, that failed, joined in the celebration parade. They were victorious. Doesn't that epitomize the gospel? We say that's not fair. They didn't fight. Why get the rewards? You know something, friends? God doesn't work according to our rules. God doesn't work according to our rules. The gospel is all about grace. Wow, beautiful. Gospel about grace. They all enjoyed the benefits of the day. And Gideon learned that day that the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. And I want to just share with you the, the words, and I uh, would like to have sung. We sing it at Tiki Punga. It's a beautiful song. And it's um, originally sung by Linda Randall. And the words go like this. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain. I wish I could sing it. I'd love to be able to sing it for you. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain. And you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But when things change and you're down in the valley, don't lose heart for you're never alone. We, walk by, we talk of faith when we're up on the mountain, but talk's, talk comes easy when life's at its best. But in the valley of trials and temptations and failures, 
That's when faith is really put to the test. And the God of the mountain is the God in the valley. When things go wrong, he'll help you make it right. The God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. Aren't they beautiful words? Absolutely beautiful. That is just so true. And so, friends, if we can learn from, from Gideon's experience, because Gideon is so much like me. Sometimes we have the mountaintop experiences. And sometimes we have the valleys. But always remember that the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. And the God of the day is still God in the night.